Hey guys, Pre-Med Tutor here. Today we're going to go through all you need to know about magnetism for the MCAT. All right, so let's start behind the basics of a magnetic field, uh, which abbreviation is B. So magnetic fields are created by any moving charge. So what you want to picture is it could be a single charge, so like an electron or a proton hurtling through space, or it could be a collection of charges. That's what we call a current, right? So a collection of charges, a current can run through any sort of conductive material, such as a copper wire, which is a common situation you'll find. The unit behind a magnetic field is the Tesla. Now, a good thing to keep in mind is that a, one Tesla even is huge. Think Elon Musk, think the company Tesla. They're huge, right? So you're very rarely going to see magnetic fields of that size. You might see the intermediary unit ga uh, Gauss, which is 10 to the minus 4 Tesla instead. The number of right-hand rules that you can expect to see in this video are two. There's one that we're going to use for wires and loops, so that deals with currents and finding the magnetic field. The other one deals with magnetic forces and has a cross product, so there's that to look forward to. Before we dive into the nitty-gritty, let's take a broad view picture. There are different types of materials. They fall into three categories, diamagnetic, paramagnetic, and ferromagnetic. Diamagnetic, as for for a mnemonic, think. They won't die alone, and they're not looking for any other lovers. What does this actually mean? Well, they won't die alone. They don't have any unpaired electrons. They're paired, and they have no net mag magnetic field. They're not trying to attract anybody. They have somebody. In fact, these kind of materials are actually slightly repelled, read, repulsed by others, so they're called weakly anti-magnetic materials, and they're just the kind of things you would expect. So our skin, wood, paper, plastic, water, these are the kind of things that are diamagnetic. What about ferromagnetic? All right, guys, I love my mnemonics. Ferro, iron, iron man, instant gold, right? Iron man can attract anybody. He's charismatic, he's single, he has unpaired electrons, and he's constantly looking for someone else. So permanent magnetic dipoles are present in these kind of materials. But come on, Tony Stark, he's a kind of weird dude. These dipoles are normally oriented randomly, just like he is. And no, they have no net magnetic dipole as a result. Tony never has one steady partner. Sorry, Pepper. However, if you show these materials a magnet, if you show Tony a willing chick, he'll become strongly magnetized. So these materials will be strongly attracted whenever exposed to an external magnetic field or under certain temperatures, their dipoles will reorient to align with that external magnetic field. Examples of this are duh, iron, and other things like nickel and cobalt, any kind of bar magnet. So those are things that we've played with, right, as a kid in physics lab. Those are ferromagnetic materials with the North and South Pole. And lastly, paramagnetic stuff, think partial. They're partial diamagnetic, partial ferromagnetic. They're in the middle. They're like ferromagnetic in that they also have unpaired electrons. So while they do have a net magnetic dipole, atoms are randomly oriented, so there's actually no net uh, magnetic field. It's unlike ferro in that if there is an external uh, B, they do become weakly magnetized. Now, if you've been sitting here thinking, what does magnetize even mean? It means that we align dipoles with the external field if something is magnetized. When that external magnetic field is then removed, those atoms dipoles will go back to whatever orientations they were in. So random orientations, essentially. And when you think, okay, what are these tiny little magnetic dipoles we're talking about? Think of tiny little magnets. So if an external magnetic field is exposed to something that's, let's say, ferromagnetic, then all those little dipoles, think of the dipole being each one of those atoms in the material, they'll suddenly orient in the direction of the external magnetic field. Okay, so I mentioned bar magnets before when talking about ferromagnetic materials. Understanding magnetic field lines are very important. So field lines exit a North Pole. So think, no, get away. They exit the North Pole and they enter the South Pole. And as you can see by this diagram, these lines are circular. So they continue into the magnet itself. They're a closed loop. So it's impossible to have what we call a monopole magnet, which is either a completely isolated North Pole or South Pole because then where are the field lines go? They need to end, they need to close in a loop. Okay, there are two important equations that we're gonna go through right now that deal with magnetic fields. The first one is the magnetic field of a wire. So at any perpendicular distance r, this is the equation you wanna to use to find the resulting magnetic field. 
This is also the time where I'm going to introduce you to the first right-hand rule that we encounter in magnetism. So that right-hand rule, if you look at the diagram here, you point your thumb in the direction of the current I running through this wire, and then your fingers will curve and show you the direction of the magnetic field. So for this diagram, my thumb is up for the current. On the right side of that wire, my fingers are going into the screen right now. So the X's indicate into the screen. That's the, that minus Z direction is the direction of our magnetic field there. Then as you cross over to the left side of this wire, my fingers are now coming out of the screen towards me as indicated by those dots there. That's the magnetic field on the left side. The magnetic field of a circular loop has a very similar formula. The one thing that you have to remember about this formula is that it can only find you the magnetic field at the center of the loop, but it can find it any distance r directly above or directly below. Now, you might think that there's another right-hand rule coming up here, but it's actually the same exact one that I showed you uh, on the previous slide. It's just that now you have to orient your fingers differently because you're now dealing with the circle. So you still point your thumb in the direction of I in this diagram and at just choose any point around that circle and do the same thing. Curl your fingers and see where they end up. If you curl your fingers, you'll notice that the magnetic field outside of the loop goes into the screen, into the page, and in the center of the loop comes out right back at you. That's our B, guys. The second most important topic uh, of magnetism is talking about the forces. What are these magnetic forces that we can calculate? Now, before I talk about the equations themselves, I just want to stress this is the number one mistake I see people make. A charge or a current's own magnetic field, so the magnetic field that it creates, that we just you know, use those right-hand rules to find the B that the uh, current was creating, their own magnetic fields cannot cause a force on themselves. Okay, their own magnetic fields cannot cause a force on themselves, which is why in these following equations, I made sure to label the B as EXT or external. You're only ever dealing with external magnetic fields and seeing how they uh, affect your charge or current of interest, okay? And just keep in mind that the units of force is Newtons, that's kind of a throwback to kinematics, early physics, uh, but still important. Um, Q here in the first moving charge equation, that refers to your charge. Remember that could be positive or negative. V is your velocity. In the second equation, your L, that's your length of your wire. And I, of course, is current. Now you saw those cross products, guys. This is where we have our second right-hand rule. Now, the best way to think about this is in three steps. So the first thing you're gonna do is look at your first variable of the cross product. That's your V here. You're gonna point your right hand in the direction of V, so the direction of the velocity. You're then gonna curl or point your fingers, bend your fingers, really, in the direction of the second variable, which is B, the magnetic field. Once you do that, your thumb is pointing in a certain direction. Guess what? That's your direction of force, specifically the magnetic force in this case. Now, this is very similar to the right hand rule that you apply with the torque equation. Why? Because they're both cross product laws, right? Um, and just to keep in mind, for any moving charge calculations, I would always recommend do the right-hand rule first. So find the direction uh, based on the instructions I just gave you. And then if your Q is negative, flip the direction that you just got. Flip the direction that your thumb just pointed. So let's say I did this right-hand rule and my thumb is pointing up but let's say my charge is actually negative, it's an electron, then that means that the force it's experiencing is actually down. All right, guys, that's a very important point. Um, and that's it, that's all you have to know for magnetism. Feel free to let me know if you'd like me to go through any calculation, any examples uh, that will help you understand these concepts better, guys. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. Good luck, guys.